Good morning, everybody. So it is a pleasure for me to introduce to you our keynote speaker today, Dr. Thomas Farley. Dr. Farley is the commissioner of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. Under his leadership, the agency is addressing the social and environmental factors underlying the leading causes of death and disability. He has developed innovative strategies to fight obesity and create a healthier food environment, including actions to reduce consumption of sugar-sweetened beverages. Also, he has established an initiative to help low-income neighborhoods buy fresh fruits and vegetables and mandated calorie labeling at chain restaurants. Dr. Farley is trained as a pediatrician and he serves in the Centers of Disease Control's Epidemic Intelligence Service. He is the co-author of Prescription for a Healthy Nation, a new approach to improving our lives by fixing our everyday world. Dr. Farley is going to talk today to us about the New York City's attempts to reverse the obesity epidemic. Dr. Farley. Thank you and good morning. The, um, first, I want to thank the conference organizers for giving me the chance to speak here today um, and also thank them for having the courage to invite the New York City Health Commissioner to talk about what they're doing on obesity in Atlanta, uh, which is the nerve center for Coca-Cola. Uh, and if you don't fully understand that, you'll learn more about it as I speak. Um, my health department, like most health departments in this country, started up in the 1800s um, in response to public demand to respond to uh, health crises of the time, which were epidemics of infectious diseases like cholera and yellow fever. So we're now about 200 years later, and we have a new epidemic of obesity and its health consequences. Uh, and this differs from the epidemics of the 1800s to me only in that it is not caused by an infectious disease. It is otherwise very similar. It's certainly no less severe when you count the number of people who are suffering and dying. And as was the situation in the 1800s, while we're not totally ignorant of the causes of the epidemic, our understanding is incomplete. So we still have much to learn about that, and that's a lot of what you are going to be contributing to. But despite that, uh, the numbers of people who are suffering and dying demand a society-wide response. We have to act with our incomplete knowledge. And finally, I think it's similar because the ultimate cause of the infectious disease epidemics of the 1800s, like the ultimate cause of the obesity epidemic today, is the environment in which we live, the influences we get every day, which set the conditions for allowing an epidemic to occur. Uh, and that means our solution to the problem is going to be in changing that environment. And so I'm going to talk about how we're trying to do that in New York City. But before I do that, I want to describe uh, briefly what I consider to be the severity of the problem in the city and then our understanding of the problem uh, so that you can, from that, go to what is our, our, our responses to it. So, um, first, this is uh, the trend in obesity in New York City, our take on the epidemic. This comes from an annual telephone survey that uh, I'm going to refer to a couple times in the talk, uh, self-reported height and weight, which we know underrepresents total, uh, uh, total weight for height. Uh, with this, we have 24% of uh, New York City adults now being classified as obese. There's another third or so who are overweight. Uh, you see the trends. The obesity rates are now almost double what they were in the 1990s. Uh, when you add that and you figure that we're well over 60% obese or overweight, uh, you can recognize, again, that while there are inter-individual differences, uh, it's normal to be unhealthily overweight in New York City, suggesting our problem is normal people in an abnormal environment. Now, that epidemic is driving a second epidemic of diabetes, uh, as everyone here knows. In New York City, we're now up to almost 11% of adults have uh, uh, physician-diagnosed diabetes. There's another couple percent who have diabetes that are undiagnosed, so we're probably around one in seven New Yorkers who have diabetes. Now, what are the consequences of that? They are huge. To put it in uh, 
first numbers, uh, we estimate there are 650,000 New Yorkers out of a city of 8 million who have diagnosed diabetes now. That's up by 200,000 just in the last decade. This problem is also one where we have among our larger health disparities by uh, race and income. So African Americans and Hispanics have diabetes at rates twice that of whites in New York City. They're up now at 14% prevalence. And if you just, uh, in, in very simple terms, try to think of the toll of this, you can measure when is diabetes uh, listed as a cause of death on death certificates. We have about 1,800 deaths per year when it's listed as the primary cause, and 5,700 where it's listed as either a primary or contributing cause. So even if you account for the fact that a certain amount of type 2 diabetes will occur even if we didn't have obesity, you can say that there are certainly thousands of deaths that are occurring each year that are attributable to the obesity epidemic in New York City. Imagine for a moment if I had an infectious disease epidemic in the city that was killing 5,000 people this year, and what the, the public outcry would be for government to respond to the problem. Uh, and, but the fact that the obesity epidemic is killing that many people, not just one year, but every year, to me only me means it's even more important for us to respond. And so that's what we're trying to do. So uh, how do we conceptualize the problem? First, um, one thing we know is that there are limits on humans' ability to refuse food. Uh, Humans are species, like every other species, that have evolved through many more periods of famine than excess. Uh, and so we don't have well-designed mechanisms to avoid food when it's available to us. In fact, it's just the opposite. Uh, and when there's food available to us, we want to store it and pack it away and prepare us for the next famine. Um, and there are good studies to demonstrate that people can refuse food for short periods of time, but it takes an awful lot of willpower, and it's difficult for them to sustain that. So that's the biologic backdrop. Uh, then what's happened is that uh, our society has changed in evolutionary terms uh, in the blink of an eye. Uh, just in the past few decades, now we live in a world where the food environment is distinctly different from what it was before. Food is now ubiquitous, it's cheap, it's calorie dense, it's served in large portion sizes, in increasingly large portion sizes, um, and it's heavily promoted. Now I want to go through each of those in turn to give you a sense for how we, uh, we see those playing out in, in New York City. But it's worth pointing out first here that this doesn't just happen, okay? This is the result of marketing of the food industry. Uh, the food industry can increasingly produce food cheaply. Uh, they make money by selling it. And so the more that they market, the more that they sell, the more money they make. Those financial incentives will remain and there's something we simply have to, to deal with. This is the general problem, but there's also something specific about sugary drinks that we believe is important, but we don't fully understand why and we don't fully understand exactly what pro proportion of the epidemic it uh, represents. And I'm going to talk in more detail in a minute about uh, our understanding of the, the role of sugary drinks and, and what we've done to try to address them. So first, let's go through those other aspects of the food environment. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the ubiquity of food. This is uh, just a simple measure of how much food is available in New York City. Uh, the total number of, of retail food outlets runs about 80 per square kilometer. 80 per square kilometer is a lot in its own right. Uh, it roughly uh, breaks down equally between restaurants and, um, and food stores, uh, bodegas and grocery stores. Um, and most of the, that food is distinctly unhealthy. And the simplest way to assess that or, or to demonstrate that is looking at this here, the number of bodegas and convenience stores that mainly sell chips and sodas uh, compared to the number of fruit and vegetable markets. So it's roughly 10 to 1 uh, unhealthy food. So there's an awful lot of food around in uh, licensed food stores. But the food availability goes way beyond that. Uh, this may be a little difficult to see in the back of the room, but this is a, a study that we did a few years ago in multiple cities across the country where we simply documented the availability of food in non-licensed uh, food stores. Uh, so all, every other store that you might go into. Uh, and what, what it turns out is that virtually every pharmacy and virtually every gas station has food in it. Uh, more than 50% of hardware stores have food in it. Almost half of banks have food in it. 30% of bookstores have food. When you think about it, it's almost impossible to go anywhere and not have food within arm's length. That not only provides an opportunity for people to grab a few extra calories when they're there, but it also provides cues uh, which have been shown to increase people's appetite and interest in eating food. So food is everywhere, um, and food is also very cheap, and increasingly cheap. For all the talk about how uh, expensive healthy food is, the real problem in the obesity epidemic is that unhealthy food is so cheap. 
you can go into a bodega in the South Bronx and get yourself a two liter bottle of soda for $1.25. Or you can, even if you're a kid and you have only a quarter in your pocket, you can get a four ounce uh, bottle of sugary drinks. For about two bucks, you can get about a four course meal worth about 1,300 calories. Uh, so it's amazingly cheap, even for very poor people, to eat food that is distinctly unhealthy and tends to lead to obesity. And the food that is so cheap tends to be very calorie dense. I haven't seen as much publicity as I think we should have around the idea of uh, energy density of food. The, uh, the food that is sort of the staple of the modern American diet, uh, potato chips and crackers, runs around five calories per gram. And uh, that is roughly 10 times the calorie density of the food that we probably evolved eating, things like apples and carrots uh, and, and fruits and vegetables. Why is that important? And that is, to the extent that people feel full after eating, they tend to feel full based upon the weight or the volume of what they eat, not based on the calorie count of what they eat. So that food that has a higher calorie density is going to tend to have people consume more calories than a food that has a lower calorie density. And it might not make that much difference if the, if the calorie density of foods varied a little bit, but it varies tremendously, tenfold. Then there's the issue of portion sizes. Uh, what I'm showing here is the growth of portion sizes at McDonald's over the last 60 years. Uh, and this is just data that I have available at McDonald's, but these changes have occurred throughout the entire food industry. Uh, and some of the restaurant chains there, it's worse than this. When McDonald's opened in 1955, they had only one size sugary drink, and it was seven ounces. Uh, that grew over the years, and by 2003, there were two sizes available, a 42-ouncer, and the smaller size was 32 ounces, uh, which is a quart, by, way, by the way. Uh, since then, McDonald's has brought the size down somewhat, uh, and now there are four sizes. The smallest size that's available is 12 ounces, and that's referred to as a child size. Um, and the default size you get if you order a combo meal is 21 ounces. So that's threefold uh, increase compared to what the only size was available in 1955. So many fold increase uh, compared to where we were before. And there's, um, you can certainly go to a chain restaurant in New York City and you can get a 64 ounce size. So that's nearly 10 times what was available in 1955. This same uh, trend has occurred uh, in every food item uh, that there is. It's not just soda, so french fries and burgers. Uh, as well as things that are sold in, uh, in, um, in grocery stores. And then on the top of loss, availability and cheapness, uh, there's the idea that food is heavily promoted. And we're surrounded so much by food advertising that we tend to forget that it's there, but it is very present. Uh, the soda industry spends about a billion dollars a year advertising sugary drinks. As of 2010, about four dollars were spent to promote, to, to advertise uh, drinks that had full sugar in them compared to those that uh, were water or had diet drinks. Um, and people see that across the lifespan. So preschoolers are seeing hundreds of ads per year, continues throughout our entire life. Um, and the fast food industry spends about $4 billion a year. Now, it's worth pointing out that the businessmen and women who spend this much money in advertising aren't stupid. Uh, they wouldn't advertise this much if it didn't work. And working is defined as getting people to consume more. Uh, so this advertising makes a difference something we're going to have to address and deal with. So uh, now let's talk about why uh, we focus so much on sugary drinks. Uh, we, we do focus on them a lot in New York City. Some people might say we're obsessed with sugary drinks in New York City. Um, and it's not just because of the 64 ouncer on the right side of the uh, picture here, which by the way has almost 800 calories, uh, some 50 packets of sugar in it. Um, but there, there's a lot of research out there that really draws this connection to this and the obesity epidemic. Uh, for instance, if you look at all the food items and in, in growth in food item consumption over the last 30 years during the major uh, run-up of the obesity epidemic, there's no single food item that's shown a greater increase in calories in sugary drinks. It's now a source of about a third of added sugars. Um, you can calculate simply if you say if someone adds a 12-ounce soda to their diet and doesn't change anything else, uh, every day for the course of a year, uh, you can calculate that's enough calories for someone to gain 15 pounds. Now we know that there's compensation and it doesn't actually work that way. Nonetheless, it does suggest that it doesn't take an awful lot of this product for, to explain an awful lot of obesity if it's used across, uh, in, in large quantities across an entire population, which it is. Then there are an increasing number of very well-designed studies, uh, I'm sure many done by people in this room, uh, showing this connection between sugary drink consumption and either obesity at a cross-sectional level or weight gain over time, including um, randomized control trials, uh, the gold standard. There's clearly something about 
putting sugar in water and giving it to people that tends to have, help people gain weight. I don't fully understand why, but I definitely see, believe the connection is real and important. Now, at the national level, it's also, I think, telling to see the parallel in growth in sugary drink consumption uh, to the growth in obesity in America. So you can see the carbonated soft drinks in this uh, graph. This is data from the, the USDA. Uh, showing an increase starting in the late 1970s, peaking around 2000, um, and then a little tail off after that. So a big increase while obesity rates went up. Uh, now some of the reduction in, between 2000 and 2010 has been replaced by non-carbonated sugary drinks, which is an important problem that we uh, need to get ahead of. But some of that plateauing is real, um, and I think it may be uh, partly explaining some of the plateauing we are seeing in, in growth and obesity in the United States, and some of the other changes that I, uh, in children, which I'm going to talk about later. Um, in New York City, uh, we have recently done a uh, dietary survey of, uh, of about 500 New Yorkers. These are people that were recruited from a random digit dial telephone survey, uh, which was meant to be representative. Then they did the a dietary survey online. Uh, and so it, the, the sample was biased a little towards people who were more educated because they had to have a computer to do it. Uh, but the results, I think, are still interesting and, and important to us in the city. About uh, a little less than 40% said they consumed sugary drinks in the day before. Uh, of those that did, they consumed about 200 calories in sugary drinks. But interestingly, they consumed almost 600 calories more than people that didn't consume sugary drinks at all. Uh, so there's at least a correlation there between consuming sugary drinks and overeating. Uh, and it may be more than just a, uh, a coincidence. And we found that consumption of sugary drinks was associated with a greater uh, increased risk of uh, being overweight or obese, uh, with an odds ratio of 2.2, so pretty uh, substantially increase for every 10 ounce increase in consumption. So at the individual level in New York City, we are seeing a strong connection between consumption and weight gain, and, and, and obesity, I'm sorry. Uh, and we're also seeing an ecologic level. This data also comes from that same telephone survey that I showed you earlier. Uh, only the data is aggregated up to the neighborhood level, and we're looking at it across three years. So we asked people about their consumption of sugary drinks, and we asked them their height and weight. Um, and what I'm plotting here is the percent of adults uh, in each neighborhood that consume sugary drinks on the x-axis, and uh, obesity prevalence on the y-axis. And each data point here has got a symbol and a color according to which of the five boroughs of New York City it is from. Now, if you know anything about New York City, you know that there are big differences between the different boroughs uh, in the racial makeup and the socioeconomic makeup. Uh, but what's striking here is there's this very strong correlation between consumption at the neighborhood level and obesity rates at the neighborhood level, regardless of what borough you're in, uh, regardless of, of your race or socioeconomic status. Uh, now, this isn't just an ecologic study. It's just cross-sectional. It doesn't prove the connection. On the other hand, when you put it in the context of the individual level data I just showed you and all the biologic data that comes to this, it does make a strong case that sugary drinks are important contributors to weight gain and obesity in New York City. So that's why we're focused so much on them. Uh, so, uh, and I'll talk about what we're doing on them in a minute. So what is, in general, our approach to the obesity epidemic? Uh, first, it's, it's worth mentioning here we know that there are inter-individual differences in the propensity for people to gain weight. Uh, but we have a city of 8 million people, and we can't address inter-individual differences. All we can do is think of what can we do for the entire population, all 8 million, to try to reverse this epidemic. So what we're trying to do falls in three general categories. First, we're trying to increase opportunities for physical activity. Now, I say this even though I haven't talked about physical activity uh, so far. Uh, we don't believe that declines in physical activity in the last 20, 30 years have been important drivers of the increase in obesity rates. Uh, we do think physical activity rates are too low, and we do think that improving physical activity might help us reverse the epidemic. Uh, and we want to promote it anyway because the health benefits of physical activity are so great that it has value well beyond its obesity prevention uh, uh, purposes. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, then uh, we're trying to increase access to healthy foods that have a low calorie density. Uh, and then we're trying to reduce consumption of these unhealthy calorie dense foods, particularly snack foods and particularly sugary drinks, through things like information and media messages, uh, trying to change the availability and change the price. So let me go through each of those in turn. So first, we'll start with physical activity. Uh, the first thing you need to know about physical activity in New York City is that New Yorkers actually exercise less than Americans as a whole. 
but they are far more physically active. Uh, in fact, New Yorkers get more physical activity in the form of transportation than Americans get in total physical activity. So this slide is showing physical activities measured by the Global Physical Activity Questionnaire, a uh, well-standardized questionnaire, uh, where we can break down physical activity by type. Um, and you can see here that New Yorkers have about a 60% gra greater total uh, moderate to vig vigorous physical activity minutes per week than Americans as a whole, and it's almost all in the form of transportation. Now, if you've been in New York at all, uh, and you've been to Manhattan, you're not surprised by this. Uh, it's darn difficult to drive around, uh, but it is uh, easy to walk and easy to take public transit, and so that's how people get around, and so we all get a health benefit from that. But not all of New York City is Manhattan. Uh, there is Staten Island, there is the Bronx, there is uh, Queens. Those areas tend to be much like the rest of the United States, uh, suburban, uh, car-dependent, less walkable. And there are researchers at Columbia University that we work with that have done this study where they took every neighborhood in New York City and they scored it based upon their uh, urban design features on a walkability scale. Uh, having done that, then they compared uh, the different quartiles of walkability to total physical activity as measured by accelerometer. So this is objectively measured built environment versus objectively measured physical activity. And you see that there are big differences in the total physical activity in the more walkable neighborhoods compared to the less walkable neighborhoods. Uh, and it implies to us that if we can have the less walkable neighborhoods more walkable, uh, that we can get big increases in physical activity uh, for the city as a whole. And so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, really, all of the work that we're using in the, in the health department to try to promote physical activity is around trying to change the built environment. How are we doing that? We, are, we don't design the built environment in the health department, but <coughs> we, um, we work with people who do design the, the built environment. So we worked with architects um, and developed uh, what we call active design guidelines. These are guidelines for architects and landscape architects and urban planners of all sorts on how to design buildings and streets and neighborhoods that make it natural for people to be physically active when they uh, go through those spaces. Uh, these are just uh, voluntary guidelines, just suggestions. Uh, we put them out there, made them available. We've had thousands of people really across the world who have gotten copies or downloaded copies. Uh, but increasingly, we are trying to put teeth into them. And recently, the mayor just signed an executive order that said that when the city government uh, puts in place a construction project, uh, that at a minimum, the designers have to look at these guidelines and try to incorporate the ideas into that. And so over time, and this has got a long time horizon, uh, we should be reshaping the city to be more walkable and bikeable. Now, in the meantime, we recognize that New York City is a very vertical place. We have lots of tall buildings, and that provides opportunities for physical activity in the form of stair climbing. So we've done some simple things, like uh, promoting stair climbing with these stair prompts. So you see here this, uh, that green sign, burn calories, not electricity. We've distributed 38,000 of those across the city. Uh, so they're right next to the elevator to encourage people to take the, uh, take the stairs. Uh, we've done an evaluation, so it does increase stair use. Um, and uh, we are now, we have a bill in front of the city council that would require in new, newly constructed buildings in New York City that they at least make the stairways unlocked uh, and something you can see in so that people aren't afraid to go into those stairways. We try to gradually shift to have the stairways be a more natural feature for people's day-to-day -day world. Uh, we also work with other city agencies to make the city more walkable and bikeable. Our transportation department is doing a fabulous job of putting in more bike lanes, including uh, protected bike lanes like the one you see here. So we've got more, 300 miles total of bike lanes they've put in since 2007. And the Parks Department has a really interesting goal, uh, which they've expressed quite publicly, that to make it so that every New Yorker in the city of 8 million people will ultimately live within a 10-minute walk of a park or playground. Um, and that's because people are willing to walk about 10 minutes to go to some destination. Uh, and now, we haven't gotten there yet, but over the last six years, there are about 500,000 additional New Yorkers who meet that definition now, who are within 10 minutes walk of a park or playground. So we're making real progress in that. So that's physical activity. Now, now on the food side, we know our food environment is distinctly unhealthy for us. We want to change that food environment, and we actually have limited leverage around that food environment. And so we've tried to figure how we can use the leverage we have. The first place we started was uh, looking at the government as a food purchaser itself. 
New York City uh, has lots of government agencies. We are a place that actually believes in government. Uh, we, through those government agencies, thank you. <laughs> Uh, helps me out. Through all those government agencies together, we estimate that we purchase and serve more than 260 meals of snacks per year. That's a big presence in the marketplace. Uh, so that if we, if the government distributes healthy food, that'll benefit a lot of people. It will also mean that the producers and distributors will have more healthy food available, so other purchasers may produce, may purchase healthier food too. So we started in schools, uh, and by coming up with standards for what is uh, distributed in schools, not just in the cafeteria, but also in vending machines, beverage and food vending machines, also in, in things like fundraisers, when they want to raise money for the soccer team. Uh, in particular, we eliminated sugary drinks from schools in, way back in 2003. We said, you know, if children are important to this, and we think they are, uh, why stop at school? Our health department regulates child care centers in the city, uh, and so the Board of Health uh, passed a rule at the request of the health department back in 2007 that had a variety of elements to it, but among them, it eliminated sugary drinks from daycare centers. So the kids are not getting the juicy juice in daycare anymore. And then we said, why stop there? Uh, let's think about the rest of the government. And so we established food standards for all of city agencies uh, over a course of time. So first we had standards for meals and snacks that they would purchase and serve. Uh, then we went to beverage vending machines, then we went to food vending machines. And there's standards for things like trans fat and sodium, but there are also standards for things like sugary drinks. And for when you're serving meals, there are minimums for fruits and vegetables. The, uh, in the, the vending machines, we do allow sugary drinks to be sold, uh, but we limit them. They have to be no more than two slots, and they have to be at sort of the lowest selling position. And that's what we can do in government. And now we're in the stage of trying to move beyond government to influence the rest of the food environment with uh, whatever leverage we have. So I'm going to give you four examples on this slide, which each of which is not large in its own right in a city of 8 million people. But we hope cumulatively, we'll, over time, will have an effect of shifting people's uh, expectations and, and uh, about what food is appropriate. So the uh, one is working with hospitals. Uh, hospitals are in New York, as in many places, uh, among the biggest employers. Uh, and so we took our food standards that we use for the government and we offered them up on a voluntary basis to New York City's 50 hospitals. And of those, more than 30 now have adopted those standards in some form, either in their cafeteria, for their vending machines, or their patient meals. Uh, so ideally, you shouldn't be going in a hospital for your you know, cardiac cath uh, and seeing a bunch of junk food in the vending machine there. And, and I think that's that has changed a lot and will continue to change in New York City. Um, we are also working on a voluntary basis with retail food stores, uh, both bodegas and grocery stores, uh, in a, a neighborhood in the South Bronx where our obesity rates are the highest, where we're asking them to do some pretty simple things, uh, to take the, the food that they already sell that is healthier and make it more prominent uh, so that they don't have the soft drinks in the checkout aisles and so that the diet beverages or the water are going to be at eye level rather than uh, down at the bottom shelf. Uh, a few simple things they can do to just make them more prominent, the healthier items. Uh, if that works, we hope to spread that across the rest of the city. We have also developed the idea of New York City green carts. Uh, what are green carts? These are uh, mobile food vendors uh, that are established with a specific license. They can only sell fresh fruits and vegetables, and they can only sell them in underserved neighborhoods. Now, we established this categorization and then open it up to people. The city doesn't put any money into this, uh, but there are entrepreneurs in New York City who wanted to be able to sell on the street. And so we have more than 500 active permits now. And so you see this in low-income neighborhoods across the city, a green cart that looks like uh, the picture you've got here. And then we came up with a program that we call Health Bucks. These are $2 vouchers that people in the SNAP program can use to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables at farmer's markets. And the idea here is that it gives people money to buy healthy food at farmers markets, but also drives them there in the first place. So when they're there, they'll use their own uh, EBT, their own uh, uh, food stamp benefits, and their own cash to buy healthy food. Uh, all, to, uh, all of this is, falls in the general category of trying to gradually shift this very large uh, and ubiquitous food environment to a healthier mix of products. Uh, now, how are we using information and media messages to try to change things? Well, the first thing we're doing is we are trying to raise the awareness of parents about childhood obesity so that they can be more careful about what they serve their children at home. 
So beginning in 2005, six school year, uh, every child who's in PE class in public school in New York City gets weighed and measured. Uh, we also measure their fitness. Uh, this is New York City fitness gram. Um, and parents get a personalized report of their children uh, with a simple graphic like this that shows whether the child felt, uh, is in the healthy zone. And if they're in the unhealthy zone, uh, then there's personalized text that says what they can do, such as things like don't feed your kids sugary drinks. Um, then we try to raise calorie awareness at chain restaurants. Back in 2006, uh, the Board of Health passed a rule that required that chain restaurants post calorie counts on their menus and menu boards. Uh, we were sued twice uh, by the restaurant industry. We ultimately won, so it took a while for the counts to go up, but they did go up. Uh, and now it, the idea has been included in the Affordable Care Act, as probably many of you here know. And if the FDA ever gets moving, we ultimately will see this uh, across the rest of the country. For those of you who haven't followed the literature on this, it has been evaluated um, in a number of different ways. So just to talk about that for a minute. Some of the studies do show uh, from pre to post a uh, reduction in the calories that people purchase. Some of them have not shown a reduction. Uh, in a study that we did with about 10,000 consumers, we found about 15% said they used the calorie counts. And those that did were purchasing about 100 calories less. And we found that the effect varied by restaurant chain that it appeared that maybe the more upscale chains had a greater effect in the chains that tend to serve lower income customers. So, um, and, oh, and one other feature that had just come out that I think is interesting is Seattle, which uh, did this around the same time that we did, found uh, when they evaluated that there was no effect on calories purchased six months after the calorie counts went up, but there was an effect at 18 months. Uh, so finding just the opposite of what I expected uh, I expected that after initial sticker shock that people might just ignore those numbers. But instead, it looks like over time, people are becoming more familiar with the numbers. They're using them more for the calorie purchases. Nonetheless, all these effects are small. We should be honest about this. This is not by itself going to reverse the epidemic. It's a good thing. It contributes to the solution, but its, it's effect is not going to be large. So we are then trying to use mass media to get health messages out to people. If uh, the food industry is spending billions, the least we can do is spend a few hundred thousand to try to get uh, healthy messages out there to counteract that. So this is just one example uh, of a campaign that we ran to try to raise people's awareness of the problem of increasing portion sizes. That increasing portion sizes have been presented by the food industry as a good deal. Uh, something you want to do when your money is tight, uh, when in fact people actually spend more for food that they don't need. Uh, and so we want, we here drew the parallel between increasing portion sizes and increasing obesity, and we gave people the message to cut your portions and cut your risk. And we have used, this is one campaign we did, but most of our campaigns have focused really specifically around sugary drinks. Uh, this is the first one we did in 2009 in uh, posters that were on the subway, uh, and we tried to convey visually the idea of this soda turning the fat when it goes into your body. Uh, and so the slogan, are you pouring on the pounds, appears through many of our our campaigns and uh, don't drink yourself fat is a slogan we've used a lot. Um, and we, so we started on the subway and we've moved now to uh, the television as well. And I've got one here, let's see if this works, to show you uh, one of our more recent TV ads. Does this sound familiar? You grab a mid-morning soda, a sweetened tea at lunch, a frozen coffee drink in the afternoon, and a couple of sodas at dinner. Seems harmless enough, but that many sugary drinks a day can add up to a lot of extra sugar. And all that sugar can bring on serious health problems, including obesity, which causes type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and even some cancers. So don't drink yourself sick. Go with water, seltzer, fat-free milk, or unsweetened teas instead. Does this... Oh, thank you. We, um, we have a long history of running some pretty tough uh, anti-tobacco ads in New York City. Um, we, you know, we don't see any virtue in subtlety. Uh, and so, you know, we want to hit people between the eyes there. And, uh, and these ads, we do evaluations of all of our campaigns, and people recognize these campaign, recognize the ads, um, and they say that they are using them to, to change their, uh, their uh, behaviors. So now, we're also trying to use price uh, to influence sugary drink consumption specifically. And here's the rationale behind that. Every item that we purchase has a thing called the price elasticity, which is just a measure of how much sales fall for every increase in price. Uh, and price elasticity varies across different sorts of products. Um, one thing we know is that food in general is not very elastic. 
Uh, that is to say, food is treated more like a necessity, um, and in fact, food is a necessity. That is to say, the people are not very price sensitive. However, among food items, uh, sugary drinks tend to be treated more like a luxury, which is to say, when the price goes up, people can shift to other items. So the best estimate from this review article was that the price elasticity for sugary drinks was minus 0 0.8, which means if you raise the price by 10%, you reduce sales by 8%, and then hopefully consumption by 8%. So with that in mind, we uh, proposed back in 2008 um, a sugary drink tax of one cent per ounce. It, taxing it on a per ounce basis was really important uh, because that would reduce the industry incentive to supersize. Uh, it would not only increase the price of an individual bottle of beverages, but then it would encourage people to purchase a smaller size, a smaller portion, or to switch to uh, the lower calorie beverages. We estimated that, that, based upon the price elasticity, that would reduce consumption by 15 to 20 percent. And an independent model uh, that was done by some researchers, not us, uh, that to me I was on the conservative side, but an independent model estimated that would, over 10 years, save 37,000 cases of type 2 diabetes in New York State uh, and save $2 billion in healthcare costs. So these effects are not small. It is very big. Uh, nonetheless, the New York State Legislature rejected it under heavy lobbying from the soda industry, which of course hated it, and it presented it as being somehow an attack on the poor. So uh, we said, well, um, if we can't uh, get uh, a tax on sugary drinks in New York State, at least the government shouldn't be subsidizing this. At least we shouldn't be buying something for people that we know is bad for them. And so then we uh, took on the SNAP program. We estimate in New York City that the food stamp program, now called Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, it, that it, it purchases $300 million worth of sugary drinks. This is in New York City alone. Uh, put this in terms, that's roughly 100 times the size of the budget for the obesity prevention program in my department. Uh, and so we proposed a two-year demonstration project that would simply remove sugary drinks from the list of allowable purchases for SNAP. Uh, for those of you who don't know, you can't use your SNAP benefits to buy anything in a grocery store. You can't use it to buy cigarettes, you can't use it to buy alcohol, you can't use it to buy uh, um, chewing gum, uh, aluminum foil, pet food, uh, or prepared food. So you can't use it to buy a rotisserie chicken. So to add one item to that of sugary drinks really wasn't all that difficult. Uh, we proposed a rigorous evaluation. We thought conservatively it would reduce consumption by about 9%, which is still not as good as a tax, but it was still meaningful. Uh, nonetheless, USDA, under heavy lobbying in the soda industry, rejected the proposal. So, we said, well, if we can't get the state government and the federal government to pay attention, let's think of what we can do in New York City. Uh, now, the New York City Board of Health, besides regulating daycare centers, also regulates restaurants. And so it sets rules for restaurants. And uh, we are pretty intrusive about what we tell restaurants they have to do. We tell them what temperature the refrigerators need to be at. We tell them what sort of materials or cooking boards need to be made of. We tell them how their air handling units have to work. Uh, we tell them how they have to wash their hands, what sort of gloves they need to wear. Uh, and so it's not that much of a stretch from there to say, uh, to tell them what size cup they should put their sugary drinks in. And so the Board of Health rule that was presented by the department and passed uh, would put a cap on the container size for sugary drinks of 16 ounces. And it would apply to the same sugary drinks that the research has found this association with, with weight gain and obesity for. Uh, it wouldn't apply to things like uh, dairy products. Um, and just to be obvious about it, because people misunderstand this often, uh, people certainly could buy and drink more than 16 ounces if they want, but they would have to buy to more than one portion. For that matter, the, uh, the industry, or the, the restaurants, could sell more than 16 ounces. They could advertise a 32 ounce portion of sugary drinks, it would just have to come to you in two cups. Um, so we didn't think this was too heavy handed. Nonetheless, the publicity around this went around the world. This really, I, I was just flabbergasted at how much people uh, focus on this. And the soda industry hated it. I mean, if they hated a tax, they really hated this. Um, and they have fought this ferociously. Um, one of the ways they fought it is in court, uh, so they've sued us. And so far, they won. This is not appeal. We're still hopeful that we'll win an appeal. And they've also fought us in the, the world of public relations. So it's worth pointing out, while I'm at this, while this, the 16-ounce cap is sometimes portrayed as somehow draconian, that if you go just a couple of blocks away here to the world of Coca-Cola, uh, you see an ad that's from the late 1940s, early 1950s, that presented a 16-ounce bottle as big enough to serve a family of three. <laughs> so it's, it does show you something about how portion size have ballooned over the last 60 years. Uh, it also puts some temper, some of this idea that, that we're really being heavy-handed about the portion size. 
nonetheless, the, the public relations blitz has been heavy-handed. It's been huge. Um, if you go, went to New York City over a period of many months, you found that every soda truck had this ad on it. They're everywhere. Uh, every other technique of the soda industry, uh, public relations was used against this proposal. And, you know, Coke and Pepsi are pretty darn good at media. Uh, this is what they do. They're really marketing companies. Uh, and so it, it's been presented often by the press as some sort of uh, public uprising against this, uh, this initiative. Uh, but in fact, I think other people had a view more like this. <laughs> the, the, uh, um, the, uh, the, you know, the, while some people had some uh, uneasiness about the government getting in this business, uh, all the publicity about the campaign served to reinforce the idea that sugary drinks make you gain weight, that they're bad for you. So this amounted to an awful lot of free advertising for us, uh, which I thought was just great, uh, to really drive home that point. And so why is that important? Um, because this. Now I'm back to the telephone survey. The blue line here at the top uh, is our d trends on sugary drink consumption uh, over the last few years in adults. Uh, and you can see we've gone down to 36% of people saying they drink them on a daily basis to about 28%. So in terms of numbers, that means that's about a 21% reduction in just in six years. So that's a big decline in self-reported consumption. The bottom line there is from uh, our youth risk behavior survey, which is a self-administered survey done in high schools. We don't ask about all sugary drinks. It's just about soda. But it does seem to be going in parallel. So we definitely think we're seeing declines across the entire population uh, in consumption, and we think that's a good thing. Now, what I don't have data to show you on is the consumption among the younger children, uh, the elementary school kids or the preschool kids. Uh, I wish I did. The uh, California does have some of this data. And in California, uh, this is uh, just data on consumption in 2005-07 when they did one survey, and then again 2011 and 12. Uh, and you can see the reductions in consumption in the two to five year old age group and the six to 11 age group. They're not seeing declines in teenagers there. Uh, that is uh, consistent with this. Uh, this is now national data uh, that looks at uh, dietary surveys among young children, age two to six, uh, on their total calorie consumption going back to around 1990, um, and then with more details per, on a per year basis starting in 2003-04. And so you can get the sense that there was this long-term run-up in the total calorie consumption that has started to reverse itself in recent years. And if you look closely at the survey data, it looks like about a third of that decline comes from sugary drinks and fruit drinks. Uh, so it does suggest that parents may be feeding their younger children fewer sugary drinks, uh, maybe because of their awareness of the potential risks. Uh, and that's re changing total calorie consumption, at least amongst the younger kids and maybe the elementary school kids as well. And that's important because of this. We are actually starting to see declines in childhood obesity in New York City, uh, something we are very, very excited about. Uh, this is data from the WIC program, uh, Women, Infants, and Children's program, where they weigh and measure kids. Uh, in this case, it's three- and four-year-olds. The dotted lines at the bottom there are from New York City. Uh, the other lines are from Los Angeles. Uh, so in New York City, we're seeing declines in the percent of these children who are classified as obese uh, starting around 2003. We don't know what happened before then because this is the, as far back as the data goes. Uh, but the trends are, are in the right direction. The trends are small, and it's not a fast decline. But what's exciting is that they're declining at all after 30 years when they were only going in the wrong direction. And we are seeing similar trends in children in elementary school in New York City. Uh, so this slide shows data from our weighing and measuring kids in public school every year that I showed you uh, about earlier, uh, and it's the percent of those kids who are classified as obese. Uh, and it's, there's a break point in there between 10, 11, and 11, 12 when we introduced new scales to measure kids uh, in the hopes of getting measurements that were more accurate. That's a good thing, only we discovered uh, the scales also measured their height. A bunch of kids shrank from one year to the next. So, it's hard to follow trends through that, and so there's a break in there. But if you look at the overall pattern across the years, it does, it's clear. We are seeing a decline in obesity um, in, in the entire population of public school children. The decline is faster in that blue line at the bottom, the five to six year olds, than it is in the older kids. Uh, so that's also consistent with seeing greater effects in the preschool kids. 
So it may be that we're beginning to see a, an overall reverse of the epidemic, but it's starting at the youngest kids and it's gradually going to work its way up across age groups. Not what I expected, but it would be wonderful if it did uh, do that. It's again worth pointing out the decline here is very slow. This is not nearly fast enough to save the sort of lives we want to save, so we need to figure out how to accelerate that. To accelerate that, we need to understand better why it's happening. And there are a number of things that we've done in New York City that I showed you that might make it happen, but it started so early that we can't explain everything based upon what we've done in New York City. So I was scratching my head one time trying to figure out why, what might have happened around 2000 or 2002 that might have reversed this. Um, and then this is one potential explanation. This is just data on media reports on the problem of obesity going from the 1990s up until the early 2000s. So uh, obesity wasn't really perceived as a problem at all into the 1990s, but then there was this very sharp increase in reports around the late 1990s, early 2000s. So suddenly the American public became aware that this was a problem that they needed to do something about. And that may have triggered a reassessment by people of what they should be feeding their children at least, if not themselves. So, um, the, it's, I think it's really important for us to understand why we are seeing a decline in childhood obesity. And so this is my summary of, of trying to explain what my, my take on it at this point, which may change with more information in the next few months or years. Uh, first, I still, we should be honest that the cause is unclear, but it's consistent with, I think, changes in food consumption, especially reduction in sugary drinks, beginning in the early 2000s, um, and prompted, I think, by media attention to the problem of obesity. And then I think that that's been reinforced by a number of things that we have done, such as changes in school food, uh, those BMI measurements so that parents get reminders about individual children, uh, our calorie labeling, which raises consciousness about the higher calorie items, um, and so some of our specific media messages about uh, specific things that people should avoid. So if that's where we are right now, then where should we go from here? Because uh, the decline is not nearly fast enough. There's a long way we need to go to totally reverse this epidemic. Here's my thought of what we should be doing now to further address this population-wide problem. First, whatever we can do as a society to reduce the advertising of unhealthy food. The, the dollars we spend are huge. They must be effective. Um, I understand we have a First Amendment. There are limits of what we can do, but whatever we can do to reduce that advertising, we, there should be some benefit from. W we're not going to be able to totally eliminate that advertising, though, so we should think about more how we can try to counteract that advertising by putting media messages out there that talk about obesity as a problem um, and talk about the risk of sugary drinks uh, as, a, as a contributor to that problem so that at least we're, to a certain extent, counteracting the messages which are unhealthy. We should go beyond uh, uh, sugary drinks, though, because uh, sh clearly sugary drinks are not the entire problem. So we should think about media messages discouraging other unhealthy calorie-dense foods that we think are important, um, such as uh, chips, uh, salty snacks, maybe pizza. Uh, these are things which have also shown big increases in consumption in recent decades. Um, we ought to try to figure out what we can do to have healthy food more available and more promoted at restaurants and retail food stores. Some of this uh, could be done on a voluntary basis, um, and that would be great. Uh, and, but then we should look for other leverage as well. In particular, we should look to the SNAP program. The food stamp program purchases a good percentages of all the groceries in America, which means that the vast majority of grocers out there have no choice but to participate in the program. So that provides a potential leverage to make huge changes uh, in making healthier food more available, making healthier choices easier for people to make. So we should think about changing the allowable purchases in the SNAP program, and we should think about food retailer standards. If food retailers have no choice economically but to be part of this program, we can put in requirements in there about availability and promotion of healthier food that would change the retail food environment almost overnight. So that, um, that's, yeah, let me, that's my take on the obesity epidemic. Let me just finish with, with where I started. I'm going to go back one step here. Um, that this uh, epidemic, uh, like the epidemics of infectious diseases, really represents normal people living in an abnormal world. And the abnormal world having to do with obesity is our food environment that simply makes it too easy for people to consume too many calories. Now, there are financial incentives for the food industry to make it that way. Uh, and those financial incentives will always be there. They're not going to go away. Nonetheless, there are tools that we have at the society level to address that, 
to protect people from some of that food marketing, try to make healthier foods uh, more available and make healthy choices easier for people to make. And I think it, for those of us in public health who are paid, after all, to try to keep people healthy, we should use those tools, uh, despite the fact that we're going to have some controversy in doing that. Now, let me just um, finish with one thing totally aside from that. Since I have a room full of people who are researchers um, in obesity, I, I want to take advantage of the, this moment uh, and just mention a, something which I hope some of you in this room will take advantage of. Uh, as of today, we are um, making available a new uh, website called menustat.org. Uh, it's free, it's a public website, and it has information on foods that are sold in restaurant chains across the country. 66 restaurants, 35,000 foods and beverages are in this. Um, and all this is information that is publicly available on the web, except it's available one restaurant at a time. It's hard to find. We put it all in one database. So that if you want to know what all the burgers in America are like, and which has the healthiest and which has the least healthy burgers, you can do this with a few clicks. You can look at patterns and trends. And it has archival data. So we've got what was available in 2012. We're going to have 2013 of it. We have 2013 available, and we'll do it every year from now on. So that when the restaurant industry says, well, we're committing to improving our menus, uh, we can actually track that over time and see if they have, and give them credit if they have, and remind them of their commitment if they haven't. So I think this is a key part of those of us who care about this epidemic, uh, really drawing attention to about a third or half of the problem, uh, restaurants, um, and also uh, holding their feet to the fire of the restaurant industry to, to uh, make healthy food available. So again, let me just uh, finish with the idea that uh, the, the obesity epidemic is really the epidemic of our time. It is the cholera of our day. Uh, we in the New York City Health Department are uh, paid to respond to epidemics like that. We are going to continue to work on it in whatever way we can until the obesity epidemic ends. Um, and we look forward to working with you on trying to do that. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. By my watch, we've got about. Yeah, we have uh, we have um, a couple a time for a couple of questions, right? And we can start probably on the left. Uh, Carol Carol Rosnitz, yes. San Luis Obispo, California. Um, the food industry will always have lots. This is more a comment than a question. The food industry will also always have lots of money to spend to fight this. Um, I found it interesting that both your state legislature and the feds shot these things down. Right. And while I hate to get overtly political in a place like this, but then we are talking overt politics here, the Citizens United decision, uh, there's a lot of efforts to try and change that one so that maybe the um, legislatures wouldn't be so governed by the money that feeds them. Uh. I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. Yeah, yeah let me do it. I, I agree with that. Uh, just a, a couple of comments. One of them is the, uh, if you look at the, the history of the tobacco control movement, most of the creative actions happened first locally, then they later spread to states and later to the federal government. I think the same is going to happen with obesity, that local governments, because they're closer to the ground, they're less influenced by industry money, uh, they can do things that can't be done at other levels. So that's part of the reason we've had some success. Uh, but I think for people trying to make, take action, they should think first locally. Thank you, and thank you for your wonderful work. Okay, thank you. Let's go here now. Michelle Moore from Tampa. I want to congratulate you on your efforts. Uh, you're on a collision course with the sugary drinks industry. What are your plans to bring them to the table and have them partner with you? You know, in, in fact, the, uh, the soda companies, uh, on a fairly regular basis, reach out to talk to us. And so we've had lots of conversations with them. Uh, not a lot of agreement, but lots of conversations. I think that there will be times when we will agree and, and uh, we'll give them credit for making changes that we think are valuable. There'll be other times when we're going to be fierce adversaries uh, in court or in the court of public opinion. I think that it's going to have to be that way. We will always have some conflict um, and some opportunities to work together. I think if we only, if we stay away from conflict though, we are guaranteed to lose. Uh, we have to not be afraid to have conflict when we are certain that what we're doing is the right thing to do. 
Yes. Hi, Judy Stern, Davis, California. What are you doing about juice, particularly apple juice? Apple juice is 113 calories per eight ounces and 14.1 calorie per ounce. It has no nutritive value. Yeah, it is a problem. We, um, our standards do allow 100% fruit juice, uh, but only in limited portion sizes. If I'm not mistaken, I think it's eight ounces in, in schools. Um, right, I quoted eight ounces. Yeah, it's, um, I am concerned about that. It, it is tough in the political environment to say we're against 100% fruit juice, but uh, I'm concerned about that. We have not, beyond that limit we have, we've not taken that on. Um, and it may be that it's, it's not a huge portion of the problem because it's more expensive for the industry to produce 100% fruit juice than it is for them to produce just sugar water. Uh, but um, maybe we should do more. Yeah, Dave Greenbaum, uh, Moorestown, New Jersey. Yeah. Uh, it was a wonderful talk. Uh, the question I have is, paralleling the increase in sugary drinks, there's been a huge increase in non-caloric uh, uh, beverages with artificial sweeteners. And uh, even though there's no calories, there may be changes in metabolism or something that goes along with that and may have a role in obesity. Has this been looked at at all? You know, the subject comes up all the time when we put in place policies around sugary drinks. Should they cover the, the diet, artificially sweetened drinks as well? You know, um, at least one or maybe more of those randomized controlled trials, the alternative was the diet beverages, and those people didn't gain weight. Uh, so while I'm concerned about the diet drinks, I think that the, the, uh, they're not clearly bad in the same way that sugary drinks are. So we have not gone after diet beverages. Um, and, and we put them kind of in the gray zone. We neither promote them nor do we attack them. I, but I'm looking to actually this group to inform us in the future about what we should do on them. Thank you. Bob Brolden, uh, Princeton, New Jersey. Uh, again, congratulations on some wonderful work. It's great from uh, a neighboring state to hear the other side of the story. And I truly congratulate you and your colleagues on your efforts. In terms of further reduction, in obesity, I would suggest a great place to go is the public school system in terms of education. Uh, I'm a bariatric surgeon, and I'm continuously amazed at how little my huge patients know about count, counting calories, caloric content of food, and it, it appears that you are making an impact in the pediatric population in New York City, and you're to be to, are to be congratulated on that. But I would strongly suggest that whatever efforts you can do to bring this sort of education into the curriculum of the public schools would be a great way to make more progress. Thanks. Thank you. And just a, a response to that, the, um, we do have health education in the schools. We do try to get the right messages to kids in schools. But in the history of the tobacco control movement, the, a mistake was made where all the resources were uh, put often to teaching kids in schools. And there are good studies that showed very little impact of that. Uh, and so shifting resources towards society-wide responses like tough ads on television uh, was a real advance. So while we need to get the right messages in schools, we definitely don't want to only work in schools because I think we would lose if we did that. I think we will take one more question on this uh, side. Alan Galipter, New York Obesity Research Center. Uh, Dr. Fawley, thank you for an informative and inspirational talk. Our group recently published a paper in obesity showing that a discount of 50% on fruits and vegetables and non-caloric beverages led to a 50% increase in intake of those products. So basically, we're looking at an elasticity of one, which is relatively high. Mm -hmm. uh, given that the government is already subsidizing various foods like corn, wheat, and soybeans, do you think a promising path could be to encourage the government to consider subsidizing the cost of fruits and vegetables, m m most likely at the farmer level? Yeah. First, let me just I agree with you very much that price is a piece of leverage here which could be very, very powerful. Exactly how to do it uh, is not easy to figure out. So we thought that taxing sugary drinks, something that we know is bad, that had no redeeming qualities, was a good place to start. Um, Subsidizing fruits and vegetables clearly has a cost to it unless you're taxing something else. So it's actually, we thought, tougher politically to do. I don't know whether farmer subsidies works to reduce uh, the cost at the retail level, uh, but I would love for people to figure out how to do that. It, that's sort of beyond what we can do, but I do think in general price is a lever which we need to continue to look at.
Thank you very much. So I wanted to uh, thank very much Dr. Farley for this uh, very, very uh, interesting talk. And we want to give you, on behalf of the Obesity Week, organizers a plaque to be one of our keynote speakers. Thank you very thank much. Thank you very much.